special music, now we know what that means, huh? Great. Thank you all. Thank you all. Is there um, any other evacuees or refugees from Katrina besides the Coleman's here uh, this morning? Uh, up here? There's some back there. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to put you all on the spot by asking, you know, well, what happened to you and all that kind of stuff. I, what I want you all to feel is that you have, you have found a home while you're here. This is a refuge place for you. You are amongst God's people, and God's blessings can be found here. And we, we, we want you to know that we will do anything we can to accommodate you and your needs, and we pray for you during these coming days and weeks. Members of this church, I know, have been very extremely proactive in donating their times, their possessions, their homes, their money, and their prayers. All of us on the staff here these last few days have been covered up with calls asking how they can help and suggestions on things we can do. Every time I talk to someone, I found out how they have just donated their time in a shelter or took some possessions down or opened up their home to someone. But I truly expected no less from all of you. As a church, I think we'll become more involved as in the coming days and weeks as the needs kind of refine out and we can find out more about what we can do, not just as individuals, but as a church body. And Barbara talked about some of those, but the situation is very fluid, and we're trying to keep in touch with what really needs to be done that best can be done as a church family to apply ourselves to these needs. But in the meantime, I would ask to don't give up your resolve to help in any way possible as an individual. I encourage you to think about volunteering at a shelter. Even if you don't think you're physically able to do much, just the fact that you're there to talk to someone, to touch them, to let them know that you, representing God, care for them, be able to touch them and let them know that there is hope. It can be a real needed ministry. And as Barbara mentioned, money can be donated either the Week of Compassion, which will help on a global scale the victims of Katrina, or just donate to KHCC Katrina, and we will use the money locally to help the people in our area. And I want to say a few words about this calamity that we are all experiencing to one degree or another, and it's a natural reaction to ask you know, why did God let this happen? And we really have to think about that and come to grips with it and accept the fact that God did not cause this to happen. Natural disasters have always happened. They are happening. And they'll happen in the future. And I think we should be less concerned about the stories of violence and the drug users and the poor planning and the lack of compassion that we see amongst some people and the sensationalism as some of the media has portrayed it. As terrible as these things are, I think we should be less concerned about that. And I think we should be less concerned about where God was during Katrina than where God is within us. These are times that can and will try our souls. And we, we need to keep Jesus' example continually renewing us when we're being tried, keeping us focused on what we're supposed to be doing since, since, not if, we are Christians. Jesus told his disciples before he ascended into heaven, feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. And we're the disciples. And that's who he's talking to. I heard one of the victims being interviewed on TV a couple of days ago. And this man was on the verge of weeping, and he said, God bless us. Somebody needs to bless us. 
and we are the somebody. This Sunday is a kind of a traditional Sunday. It's the Sunday between ministries. It's the Sunday between the interim ministry of Bob Allen and the coming ministry starting this week of David Bryce. And he'll be here next Sunday. Just for your information, and uh, Faye and I will be gone on vacation starting today. So if we're not here this week, you know, you'll know it's, it's okay and everything. And now, if the week after that I'm not here, you know, you know something else has happened. And you can, and you can. But we've now we've had time. We've had time to say goodbye to Bob and Karen and with all they've done for us, and we've given them thanks for being the right people at the right time and at the right place. And we welcome David and Leslie Bryce into our family along with their two children, Elizabeth and Will, and we ask God's blessings upon them. And usually this sermon, this sermon in between the ministries, is a traditionally a time to say something about a bright new future, and about hope and all that kind of stuff. So right now, let me give you the punchline of what I want to talk to you about today. This is the point of the sermon. I am excited and optimistic about our future here at Kings Highway Christian Church. And I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. As you all know all too well, we live in an, in an age of fast change. And our church has changed over the years along with our society and culture that we lived in. And I want you to think back. Most of you all were here 10 years ago. And I want you to think back to just our church 10 years ago and the society in which the church, our church existed. Just 10 years ago. We had one service in this church. We had no Family Life Center. We had no Hispanic ministry. The staff configuration and orientation that you had here was completely different than what we have now. Our country had a besieged Democratic president in office. The economy was booming with the dot-coms. There had been no 9-11. Only a few people carried cell phones, and gasoline was just a buck, a little over a buck a gallon. And you can take that same kind of reasoning back 30, 50, or 80 years, and you can see that we don't do church like we used to. And this reminds us that we have constantly evolved over the decades and made ourselves adapt to the changing conditions of the world and our society in which we live. And it brings us to the point on this particular Sunday of what do we need to do to be faithful to our future. So I suggest we turn to the Scriptures and see what the author of Hebrews has to say to us. The author of Hebrews may have been Paul, it may have been Barnabas, it may have been Priscilla, and some suggest even others. But whoever it was... They were writing to a congregation that they knew very, very well. And they were exhorting this church with this, throughout this epistle and giving them advice on how to do church in the first century. Starting in the 10th chapter, 19th verse. How, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full measure of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some in the habit are doing, but let us encourage one another, 
and all the more as you see the day approaching. So it leaves us perhaps with asking the question of how does Kings Highway Christian Church stack up as a church right now? And I think we're in great shape. And that's why I'm so excited and optimistic. And let me give you my reason. I think we indeed do follow the leadership of Jesus Christ. Not perfectly. No. But let me tell you, I participate in a lot of discussions amongst church members. And I get to sit in meetings in which decisions are being made. And I'll tell you that more times than not, those things happen in an environment of what do we need to do to be Christian? Not what do we need to do to be a good citizen? Not what we need to do to be a financial wizard, but to be a Christian. So I think we're in pretty good shape there. I think we have outstanding lay leadership. Our church leadership moved quickly, decisively, and effectively this year to minimize the effects of a sudden resignation and an interim ministry. And I don't mean just our elected leadership. I mean the leadership all throughout the church, the ones that set examples in choir, in band practice, in exercise, in Sunday school classes, in teaching, in youth groups. All these people are leaders because they set examples for all of us others in the church. We're in good shape there. Did you know that our attendance has not only held up during this interim period, it's actually risen? Our attendance has gone up, which is an anomaly in the life of any church who has an interim period. And this testifies to me to the health of this congregation. I assess our staff to be good and attuned to the needs of the congregation. Our physical plant is more than adequate. It needs some maintenance, but the maintenance needed is within our capabilities to address. All in all, we have wonderful buildings, a great location and we can accommodate growth. And we have an outstanding senior minister coming in. You are going to enjoy getting to know him. And let's talk about these four services that we offer every Sunday. The question may come up, doesn't this fragment us, doesn't this keep us from being a church? And I tell you, not to me it doesn't. Not at all. Those services represent four different views of one Kings Highway Christian Church. And to me, it's like the concept of the Holy Trinity. It's different manifestations of the same single thing. Of course, we've got to be careful and deliberate about keeping to know each other and, and to keep in tune with each other's needs in these different services but we all share the same values that makes us the one church that we are. And let's consider now, for church, we've got beliefs and values. What are they? And this is a touchy subject because this country has fragmented itself between the secular and the religious. And the religious has fragmented itself between the conservative and the liberal and gone all sorts of different paths. We're seeing a huge rise in the megachurches. We're seeing growth in non-denominational churches, and some say mainline Protestantism is languishing. And we see that many churches are missing, mixing politics and faith together and calling that religion. And we see other churches that seem to be basing their growth upon a message to the seekers that says, be faithful to God, and God will give you everything that you want. Rather than the message, the radical message that Jesus Christ gave us. And yet, with all that going on, 
what we see is a rising trend in the country. There are many, many seekers out there who are looking for a place to grow and worship. And they're turning away from the corporation church. And they're looking for a place that has meaning. A place that will allow and encourage growth in their faith. That encourages the honest exploration of how faith may be lived out in their individual life. That clearly defines itself to have Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ as the head of the church that doesn't have any unnecessary dogma, where they can get to know each other and relate to each other as brothers and sisters in the congregation. And friends, that's us. That's who we are. That's what we do. So I think we're in good shape. I think we're positioned very well with our beliefs and values. And all of this is why I am so excited and optimistic about the future. So I believe for the future, I think that in a very general way, I think our course should be that we should unswervingly retain our beliefs and values, but at the same time be willing to, be willing to explore meaningful ways to do church in a complex way and changing world. Michael Elmore. Michael Elmore is a co-pastor of the Great River Region. He's responsible for churches in South Louisiana and South Mississippi. Lives in Baton Rouge. I'm sure he's been busy this week and will be. But he tells the story of a friend of his, and a friend of his who also went into the ministry. And the story centers around his friend's Influence or this, the influence that two grandparents had upon him during this period of time when he decided to go into ministry. And one of the grandparents was a grandfather on this side of the family. And he was a big deacon in that grandfather's church, the grandfather was. And this man says he, although he didn't belong to the church, he remembered that his grandfather going to deacons' meetings on Sunday afternoons. And he remembered so well his grandfather as he left. He says, well, I wonder how many ways I can vote no this afternoon. And the man said that he remembers not too many years later, his grandfather was four, one of four remaining members of that church who locked the doors and disbanded it. And then the other grandparent was the grandmother on the other side of the family. And he and this man, uh, she and this man went to the same church and had for years. And as he said, at the time he made a decision to go into the ministry, the senior pastor of that particular church came to him and he said, great, he said, then let me support you by putting you on staff here for a while before you go to seminary, and this will give you experience before you go off to your formal training. He says, great. He says, and the first job I have for you, he says, I want you to go to your grandmother's Sunday school class and ask them if they'll move their Sunday school classroom to a room down the hall. You see, our nursery has gotten overloaded and we need a bigger space. So the man, obviously young, obviously naive, went to his grandmother's Sunday school class the next Sunday morning. Now remember, this is a woman's Sunday school class it had been in that room since before recorded time. They had it decorated they want to, the way they wanted to. All the chairs had been painted with their names on the back of them. And he walks in and he says, can I interrupt? Yes. She says, oh, well, we need to expand our nursery. I'm going to ask you if you all would mind going down the hall into another room there. And the grandmother, who was the matriarch of the church, said, No, we won't. And turned back around and continued teaching the class. Well, the man left, not knowing what else to do. And it was the habit of that family to have lunch over at that grandmother's house every Sunday after church. 
and he should have known he was in trouble when he stopped by the convenience store on the way over there to buy some drinks as his contribution to the family meal. And this convenience store clerk, whom he did not know, said to him as he's paying his bill, he, she, he said to him, he said, well, I understand you're trying to move your grandfather's Spanish Sunday school classroom. And he should have known he was in trouble, but he went anyway to his grandmother's house, and his grandmother was waiting for him on the steps said, there'll be no fried chicken for you today, young man. But I'll tell you what, if you want to talk about it, you can come and visit me this week and we'll talk. So the man said, and he related the story that for the next six months, every week, he'd stop by and talk to his grandmother. It was a difficult time, but finally she says to him, she says, well, I've made a decision. You want to show up at Sunday school class? this Sunday and see what it is? Yes. So he did. He didn't say anything. He came to Sunday school class. And the grandmother, with no preamble, no explanation, nothing, stood up before Sunday school class begun and said, we're moving. Picked up her chair and dragged it down the hallway to the new room. And everybody else in the class stood up grabbed their chair, and drug it down the hall to the new room. The man relates that later on, in a few years, that new nursery room became part of a wing of the church which was dedicated and devoted to children and youth ministries. And the grandmother, unfortunately, contracted Alzheimer's years later, and he visited her as often as he could, and he said that one day he was visiting her and she motioned for him to come down and it was as it often is with Alzheimer's patients she was having a good day, a lucid day and he got down next to her face and she says you and I changed the mission of that church, didn't we? and I think she was close but not exactly right see, I think she did she changed her own personal mission. And the other people in that Sunday school room changed their personal mission. And other members of that church changed their personal mention, mission. And together, yes, they did. Yes, they changed the mission of that church. And as for the other grandfather in this man's story, I believe it wasn't so much that he voted no. I think it was a fact that he didn't vote yes. He and we need to find new ways to vote yes in the life of our church. You may remember, I think it was April 17th, I preached to you on the first Sunday following Jeff Tim's departure. And I preached to you on unity and hope. And I suggested to you in that sermon that we need to strive for the unity of brothers and sisters that follow the one true and only head of the church, Jesus Christ. And I suggested to you that we have hope, not blind hope, but the hope that comes from being faithful to a God who is always faithful to us. And I believe that we've done that. And God, I think, has been good to us. And I believe that the best of times are ahead of us for you and me and our church. As we leave here today, I'd like to keep the words from the book of Hebrews in mind. Let us indeed spur each other on toward love and good deeds. And let us not give up meeting with each other. For if we meet together regularly for church and fellowship events and Sunday school classes and mission projects and exercise and knitting and choir and band practice and all those other things that we do here, then we will find God among God's people. And we will learn from each other and we will learn the needs of our brothers and sisters 
And while we're meeting, let us encourage one another to follow Christ's example. For if we can do nothing else in this world, let us encourage one another. What a difference it makes in our lives. And finally, finally, let us evolve the mission of this church for the future by changing our own personal mission. Let us renew ourselves and find new ways to vote yes. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, our, our blessings are so great. And we thank you for this church and we thank you for all the people over the years who have continually shown us the way how to be church. We now feel entrusted with continuing on our beliefs and values in service of you. Bless us in this endeavor. And give us unity and hope to go into the future. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.